I have a problem. Actually, we have a problem. We have a problem with problem solving. See, there are a lot of problems we know how to solve, sometimes even really hard ones, but there's a whole class of problems we don't know how to solve. There's a set of problems that are that we sometimes disagree on what the cause of the problem is, or we disagree on what the solution might look like. Or maybe we disagree about whether there's even a problem at all. These are some of the general characteristics of what are sometimes called wicked problems. Wicked problems are problems that resist our attempts to solve them or even define them. Food insecurity is a wicked problem. So are rising levels of depression and anxiety in teens, climate change, homelessness. Wicked problems are complex. They're global and personal all at the same time. That's part of what makes them so hard to get a grip on. Another feature of wicked problems is that they resist our repeated, persistent, attempts to solve them using our usual problem-solving methods. Our usual disciplinary approaches, our paradigmatic approaches, haven't worked. And we need something new. Today, I'm going to tell you about critical making, which is a method I teach my students to better understand and respond to wicked problems. Critical making combines two different but complementary modes of thinking. On the one hand, critical thinking and research skills that we usually associate with the humanities. And then, on the other hand, constructivist, creative making that we usually associate with design and engineering. The idea is that by combining these two different kinds of thinking, we can create a space to forge a new path forward. Today, I'm going to tell you how and when to use critical making. But first, why should you listen to me? Well, I've been thinking about how to help people solve problems for a long time. In the seventh grade, I wrote a letter to myself, my future self, which I received in high school when I was deciding what to do with my life. In the letter, I said that I wanted to do well in math and science, so that I could become an engineer. In particular, I wanted to be an architectural engineer. I wanted to build the spaces that help people do their work better. I still have drawings of submarines and ships that I drew back then. At the time, I thought these might be the most important spaces that we could create. We would uh, explore the uncharted territories beneath the waves. By the time I received the letter, I realized that we probably weren't all going to be working on the ocean floor. Rather, we'd be working in front of computer screens. And so I became a computer engineer. Over the years, I've changed my focus a few more times. I studied the history of the way Manhattan Project scientists adopted early digital computers and used them to simulate atomic nuclei. I've studied the way designers adopt emerging technologies like 3D printers and programmable microcontrollers. And I've studied the way that all of us logged on to social media to connect with another, one another in new ways. Underlying all of these projects was a singular commitment to the idea that the way that we think and the tools that we use actually affect the kinds of questions we can ask and the answers that we can get. And so as I looked around the world and I saw these persistent problems, these wicked problems, I realized that our old ways of thinking and our old tools weren't going to work. We would need to learn to think differently. Not only would we need to think differently, we would need to somehow work together. I met a lot of smart people when I went to university people who had different backgrounds, different values and commitments, and different disciplinary training. And what I realized is that chemists and psychologists and educators and nutritionists 
all think differently, and they have to. Their different ideas and different tools are part of what helps them to do their work. So this creates a bit of a puzzle. How are we going to work together while at the same time recognizing the importance of that deep disciplinary knowledge that all of these different people might have? We're not, not only do we have to think differently, we have to learn to think together. And the challenge here is that our usual methods of working together don't work so well for wicked problems. Amanda Allard, uh, one of our other speakers today, is going to tell us a bit more about this, but it's not just that we need to work together, it really matters how we work together. To solve wicked problems, we need deep, a, a really deep um, and sustained form of collaboration. Deeper than the kind of surface level idea sharing that we often associate with brainstorming sessions, and more sustained than the divide and conquer methods that we're so used to in classroom problems and workplace problems. So let me tell you why I think critical making can help. Critical making allows for two different kinds of thinking to come together. And this opens up a space for people to bring their whole selves to a problem. I want to make this a little bit concrete for you. Let me tell you how this works in my classroom. So I ask students to choose their own wicked problems, research them, and respond to them. The responses are um, what I call low fidelity prototypes. That's just fancy talk for cardboard models. And along with the cardboard models, they tell a story about the world in which that model is made real. Now, over the years, my students have come up with some really amazing projects, and I want to tell you about just one of them. It's one of my favorites. This is the shed. It's a vending machine intended to address unhoused women's reproductive health. Students started this project in a familiar fashion. They did a lot of research. They asked the question, what actually are the reproductive health needs of unhoused women? And what supports already exist? Policies, food, food banks, shelters. And then the students began to build. And this really put their ideas to the test, and it led to real learning gains. Here's just a couple of examples. First, you have to plug in a vending machine, and that limits where you can put it. Here's something maybe a little more profound. The students were committed to the idea that the items in the shed be free, but they didn't want anyone to take more than their share. So how do you control access? Their research told them that unhoused people sometimes don't have or trust government ID, so that was out. The alternative that the students came up with, a thumbprint reader, raises even more security and privacy concerns. But controversies really came to the fore when the students started to debate what would go inside the limited space of the shed. Talk about just one item, birth control pills. It's clearly related to reproductive health, but what might funding agencies think about this? Would it be legal? How about medically safe? Students ultimately decided that the shed was a bad idea. And that's the important insight that comes from combining critical thinking and constructivist creative making. For me, the great virtue of critical making is that it creates a space to think. Like Felix Cronenberg, another speaker today, I think a lot about the spaces that we create to think together. I teach in Lyman Briggs College, a residential college for science majors at Michigan State University. 
At Lyman Briggs, we pride ourselves on excellent teaching. A lot of that comes down to what we do in the classroom. But it really makes a difference when our space supports the work that we do inside that room. This auditorium is arranged so that everyone is facing the speaker. It's a perfect fit of form and function. But in a classroom, sometimes we're interested in group work, and in those cases, it makes much more sense to reorganize the seating into pods. For critical making, what you want is to be able to switch rapidly in between more critical modes of thinking, so discussion and research, and the more creative aspects, which for me is arts and crafts with cardboard. Now, I can bring a bin full of arts and crafts supplies into almost any space and do a pretty good job of critical making. But a few years ago, I had the chance to do something more. I got to fulfill the dream of that seventh grader and build my own space. I asked my students to help. <clears throat> I brought them to an empty space on the first day of classes, told them the budget, and said, I need you to help me design and build a space for students to work together to solve problems. And boy, did they deliver. These students did amazing work. They interviewed fellow students, faculty, and staff. They did site surveys at dozens of uh, both formal and informal learning spaces, ranging from coffee shops and uh, study lounges all the way to classrooms and laboratories. And in the end, the students built an amazing space that I get to work in every day. But what makes the space so amazing isn't just that, uh, that it's fun for me, it's that students got to participate fully in this design. They were able to bring their whole selves to this project. Students in Lyman Briggs are driven and high achieving, and they have a complicated relationship with failure. Actually, it's, it's not that complicated. They, they don't like to fail. <laughs> um, but they also recognized from the research that they did that there is an important arena of their lives where failure is essential, and that's games. So we incorporated games as a central feature of this space. That's something that wouldn't have happened if it was just me. Students were able to create this space together where they could bring forward their own cares and worries. I hope that by telling you these stories about critical making, I've convinced you that this combination of two different but complementary modes of thinking is sometimes a useful way forward when you're facing a wicked problem. Critical making isn't for every problem. There are some, some problems we already know how to solve, and we should just do that, even when the solution is expensive or uh, unpleasant in some way. A problem just being hard doesn't make it a wicked problem. What makes a problem a wicked one is that it resists our attempts to solve them with all of our disciplinary knowledge. So, the time to use critical making is when you need to create a new space for people to bring their whole selves and their whole cares, worries, and training to bear on a problem. And that's what we're going to need. That's what we need to face the wicked problems that surround us in the world today. Wicked problems like unhoused women's reproductive health, food insecurity, or rising levels of anxiety and depression in teens. We have a problem. Let's make the space to solve it. Thank you. <laughs>